please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jonathan Hoffman. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Hoffman, and I'm a program manager in the Microsystems Technology Office. Today, we will demonstrate an exciting result from the Ambient program. On stage with me are Alan Braun from SRI and Tom Kornack from Twinleaf, who are the real heroes realizing this Ambient work. Will it click? Success. The Ambient program seeks to bring biological imaging anywhere. And we have hooked up <laughs> the, uh, we flipped the monitors. Uh, but what is biological imaging in this context? The brain is composed of cells called neurons, which communicate via electrical pulses. Just as with the current in a wire, this creates a magnetic field. While the magnetic field of a single neuron is extraordinarily weak, we take advantage of many neurons synchronizing, which creates a larger magnetic field. This synchronized magnetic field itself is still incredibly weak, but it's detectable outside the scalp. Measuring this field is like trying to listen to a person breathe next to a jet engine taking off. On the left is a cartoon cutout of the anticipated magnetic field outside the scalp from a synchronized group of neurons. On the right is the magnetic frequency response of the brain as a function of time. And we can see that this field uh, occurs below 100 hertz. The key takeaway here is that there is a weak but detectable brain signal outside the body. Not only can we detect this neural activity, but we can create 3D time-dependent maps of it. This is known as magnetoencephalography, or MEG. There are multiple challenges to achieving this in practice. The plot on the left shows the magnetic spectral density on the y-axis versus frequency on the x-axis. The MEG signal falls below the geomagnetic noise, meaning we have a negative signal-to-noise ratio, or SNR. As a result, MEG systems are placed inside magnetically shielded rooms. These shielded rooms, pictured on the right, are large and cost millions of dollars. This expense provides a four to five order of magnitude reduction in background noise, enabling significant SNR improvements. Despite the shielding, we still need sensitive magnetometers. MEG systems today comprise arrays of sensitive magnetometers called squids that superconduct in quantum interference devices. These squids require cryogenics. Pictured in the center is a 300-channel squid array, which costs around $3.5 million. The cryogenics constrain the user to be stationary with limited motion. The combination of these expenses and constrained motion have limited the utility of MEG systems. In fact, there are only around 200 systems worldwide. Ambient will break away from these constraints. Ambient measures a magnetic field in two locations and subtracts them. This is known as magnetic radiometer, as a magnetic radiometer, and it reduces the geomagnetic noise occurring far away from the brain to drastically improve the SNR. The picture on the left now plots the magnetic radiometer density versus frequency. We see the noise floor has dropped and the MEG signals are detectable with positive SNR. We no longer require shielded rooms and we can operate anywhere. Ambient is an atom-based magnetometer known as an optically pumped magnetometer, which does not require cryogenics and can be directly attached to a person's head. This form-fit operation is incredibly useful. Cryogenic MEG, the cryogenic MEG helmet that was pictured earlier is not ideal for all patients, especially children. The helmets accommodate 80 to 90% of patients, which means it's too big for 80% of people. The ambient sensors, however, can be placed and adjusted to each user's head. This means the sensors can be closer to the signal and even allow for user mobility during MEG operation, enabling a completely new class of studies. There are multiple benefits of MEG. In terms of preclinical use, there is the potential to map stroke damage and to map brain connectivity. Maps of brain connectivity could help us understand chronic pain, Parkinson's disease, or brain maturation. This could even possibly diagnose traumatic brain injury, or TBI. The picture on the top left shows an MEG of decreased brain connectivity, which could be associated with TBI. 
Clinical usage includes epilepsy-focused localization or pre-surgical functional mapping. MEG is well suited for epilepsy studies because brain regions fire together during epileptic events and enhance the measured magnetic field. In epilepsy, MEG can detect and localize the specific pathological regions in the brain. It can also help surgeons understand regions of the brain associated with loss of sensory processing, linguistics, or paralysis. That is, surgeons can know the exact position of essential brain regions to avoid surgically induced neurological deficits. The image on the right shows the localization of pathological neurons in epilepsy. If we can read the brain, we could eventually realize various brain machine interfaces, which is pictured on the bottom left. These interfaces could be used to restore function with brain controlled prosthetics or to enhance function to improve response times. Another use case is cognitive load balancing. We can use brain signal measurements for resource management. Imagine we could sense overload situations in real time and adjust inputs accordingly. This could be used for IC analysts, pilots, or various training situations. While there are many MEG use cases, the question is, can we truly realize this technology outside of its typical constraints? Can we measure magnetic brain signals outside of a shielded room? And the answer is yes. I guess otherwise I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> Pictured on the left is Tom Kornack on stage with me. <laughs> outside. The ambient sensor is touching the bottom of that arrow and also near his head. The sensor is powered from the laptop on the right side of the image. And in this experiment, we measured an auditorially evoked signal, which you can see on the right. This is the first ever auditorially evoked signal measured outside of a shielded room. And it's a key first step towards mobile MEG. Currently, we've built a three by three array of these devices and have begun localization on a phantom. In fact, we've realized better than five millimeter resolution in this localization. Today, we're not going to perform an MEG demo, but instead we're going to demonstrate a heart measurement, which is an equally potential important spin-off of the ambient technology. Magnetocardiography, or MCG, is the detection and imaging of magnetic signals from the heart. Cellular currents that initiate the periodic muscle contractions of the heart generate volume currents, which produce magnetic fields near the surface of the chest. These signals are stronger than the brain activity due to the highly synchronous activity needed to keep the heart, beat, the heart beating. The image on the left shows one component of this magnetic field from the heart. Cardiovascular diseases are the, are the leading cause of death globally developing a widely usable device that, can, that enables early identification and localization of abnormalities could result in the treatment and potentially the prevention of death. While MCG exists today, it's too expensive and it's unavailable to patients' bedsides. Developing such a technology could be truly game-changing and it would greatly improve medical intervention for heart disease. While MCG imaging requires an array of these sensors, Today we'll show the heart signal measurement from a single sensor that can go into one of these future arrays. Before performing the demo, I'd like to briefly describe the signal we're going to see. The left image shows a previously recorded signal with the ambient sensor. The y-axis is the gradient magnetic field in picotesla per centimeter, and the x-axis is, is time. The plot shows 10 seconds of averaging from a heartbeat. The first bump is known as the P wave, which is the depolarization and contraction of the atriums. This is followed by the QRS wave, which is the rapid electrical impulse and depolarization of the ventricles. Finally, the T wave is the ventricular repolarization. Now that we know what to expect, let's get to the demo. So hopefully we've switched, and now we have a live feed of the magnetometer Pictured, this is actually not the sensor, this is just a tripod to hold it, and the sensor is just this small device right here where we have our OPM. What we're displaying on the top is the field coming off this signal, and you can see it's really noisy. It's because we're in a room, there are fans, there's 60 hertz everywhere, and this has to operate in a hospital setting in the future, so this is a good step. The bottom on the right, the bottom signal here, is the actual spectral density, and we could see our 60 hertz and our 180 hertz. If we swipe, we can, get and we can get to the premise of ambient, which is using a gradiometer. And the bottom plot down is better, and now we're showing the gradient field, which is orders of magnitude lower noise floor. And as if we swipe again, we have a live feed here of that gradient signal in green, and Tom 
who is our puppet today, will walk up to the sensor and eventually we'll see his heartbeat live in a non-contact method. So there is that heartbeat that we can see. And if we swipe again, we'll see a time average of this, clearly showing that we can see all of these different various elements in a non-contact way, which will be incredibly useful for burn victims or even for uh, Suburni patients. So this is a completely new modality. And we braved it and showed it live on stage. <laughs> So today we've demoed the underlying technology from the Ambient program, and we're all incredibly excited, and I hope you are too. We're looking to commercialize this sensor into arrays for both MEG and MCG, and hope this can be brought out really across the world in different hospital settings. So I want to thank you all for your time today, and let you know that we'll be available for questions after this uh, during the break. Thank you.